Hey, this is Groovy. We're here at Breckenridge Brewery. I'm here with Tom Rash, former Marvel Comics artist and the creator of the awesome Black Alpha. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing, Doug? I'm freaking stoked and happy. Oh, and Should I call you Groovy? Yeah. You by your Only my grandma calls me Doug, so. Oh, uh, all right, Groovy. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about, uh, we got a ton of cool stuff going on here. First, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your history. Well, I mean, for someone who doesn't know your work, what have you all worked on? Um, I used to draw for Marvel Comics about 20 years ago on Punisher 2099. Uh, since that time, I have also worked in the video game industry for years as a concept artist. And uh, for those who don't know, a concept artist is an artist like they're usually utilized in television, films, and video games. And so anything that you see, characters, environments, props, usually are designed by a concept artist. So I've been doing that for a number of years. I've worked uh, for Sony Online and uh, several other companies. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it, except for what I'm doing currently with this, so. Because Black Alpha has been a concept you've been working on for a long time. How did that all come about? Well, when I was a kid, I, you know, I've been drawing forever since I was like five years old, and I, I always tell people that the first things I saw on television were Batman, Spider-Man, and Star Trek, so I was hooked at like four or five years old and started drawing not too long after that. And I would sit there, you know, like a lot of kids, I would doodle pictures of the USS Enterprise or Spider-Man and Batman. Uh, but after a while, you know, a little later on in grade school, um, I started to notice, first of all, not just the characters, but the artists. And so John Byrne was the first artist that really got me into comics. And uh, he had actually drawn Star-Lord, which had mm -hmm. come out actually a year prior to Star Wars. And I was totally into that book. And then also A Man Called Nova, which I think came out around the same year, around 1976. And the idea of the cosmic superhero was kind of new to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of intrigued by that. And then after a while, too, and, you know, there's some kids, I don't know if all ki creative kids do this, but you tend to be like, well, here's Batman, but I'm also going to draw my really cool character, too. And so, so in fifth grade, I was like, well, I'm going to draw a space superhero, and I definitely want him to have a cool spaceship. And, uh, so that's, and, and the name Black Alpha, I think Alpha was a term that was tossed around a lot, uh, kind of dating myself, but growing up in the 70s. And uh, mm. I, I don't know where the black came from. I, it's, it's weird because there's kind of a phonetic hook that I learned later on, but that was just the name that just stuck, and I have no idea why. I guess it sounded kind of superhero-y to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and so that, that concept of a, a character who has been, like I said, a cosmic hero and the ship was the only thing that remained. And, uh, it's, but it's been you know, percolating in my brain for many years. And even as a kid, like, I'd fantasize like, about, like, I would love to have toys of this. I would love for this to be a movie. I'd love for it to be a Saturday morning cartoon. And so now I've decided within the last couple of years, you know, with everything that we have at our disposal in the current you know, age of technology, that I'm going to make that happen. So. Um, and then I guess if you want, I can kind of tell you what the premise is, you know. Yeah, the premise and, you know, the general vibe so people know, like, you know, what, the, what his attitude's like and all that kind of good stuff. Well, the, the quick pitch I tell people is, what if you took the Batman story, you sprinkled in some Iron Man tech, and then you dropped it off in the middle of a Star Wars-like universe? Uh, the more in-depth thing is that there's these 12 star systems of Kradia, which are called the provinces, and each star system has a group of these guardsmen, and each guardsman has a faction. Their job is they protect, you know, the people of the realm, so to speak. Mm. Um, they, they tend to find applicants, or you can apply to this academy. They want to find people who have, a, you know, a code of honor, a person of strong morals and stuff, because the way that it works is you get this thing, this, you know, he has a cell suit, and it's an augmenting suit. So anything that you do, you know, it gives you, like, if you run, you run faster. It increases your speed. It kind of gives you the basic equivalent of superpowers in a suit. Oh, no. um, and the idea is that when you get this suit and you become a cadet, you, once you graduate, you get this suit and it's bonded to like, you know, your DNA, brainwave patterns, you know, just pretty much your persona. That suit only operates for that pilot is what I call it, you know, um, until that pilot's deceased, you know, then, then it can generally work for someone else. But there's been a lot of political upheaval in these star systems. And so after a while, there's been this mysterious threat that's actually killing off these factions of guardsmen they haven't been able to, I guess, replenish their ranks, so mm -hmm. to speak. So the outlying systems have all kind of, they don't have the guardsmen protecting them anymore, so they've mm -hmm. all started to decay into like corruption and war and all that kind of stuff. Um, my lead character, his name is Trandon Antares, as a young boy, he wanted to grow up being one of these things. That was like his big thing. Well, during his time of being a young child, transitioning into his teens, that's when the guardsmen faction started to die off. And of course, the new government came in and, you know, there's, there's reasons that'll be explained in the comic, like, you know, why they just didn't like, create a whole new program or something of guardsmen coming in. So, right. of course, he feels despondent as he gets older because he's like, these heroes, these mythical like folk heroes that he looked up to, they're not around anymore. And so he's seen his entire existence just, you know, once again, dilapidated, just completely decayed. So he, uh, he ends up, and I follow the superhero tropes too, of like, 
you know, usually the, the, the hero ends up having a tragedy happen. Right. The family's killed, that sets him on his hero's journey. Uh, in this particular case, he, he kind of has a feeling, he, he's not around when his family's killed. He has a, an idea who's responsible for it. So initially he goes to like the authorities, he tries to go to the, the, one of the guardsmen councils and nobody will respond. So he takes it upon himself to like, I'm gonna try and find out who did this. He tries to infiltrate the underworld and of course he, he doesn't really get any results and after spending enough time there, he ends up becoming one of these like kind of, un, you know, these unruly figures, a wretched hive of scum and villainy. So he ends up serving aboard a pirate freighter um, he kind of lost his way for years, and then um, he ends up uh, befriending this captain of this pirate freighter, and they always do, uh, they, they basically appropriate like all of these different weapons and stuff, and then they pull cons on a lot of the people that they're trying to sell the weapons to. This particular con goes bad, he escapes, the ship is destroyed, he escapes like in a life pod, ends up crash landing on this planet, and he ends up finding this suit and this ship Oh, that belonged to a fallen guardsman. Okay. So initially when he gets these things, he's like, oh, well now I have these weapons and I'm gonna use these to seek vengeance on, you know, who destroyed my family. So, so some of the archetypes that I'm following is like Peter Parker, like, you know, he grew up kind of in poverty. He ends up getting this thing and initially he doesn't think about using it to become a hero. He's like, I'm gonna use this as a weapon. But of course, after spending enough time and the fact that where he's at, there's no guardsman presence anymore through maturity and experience, he'll be like, okay, now that I have these tools, I can actually use it to help people. Right. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of his, you know, it's kind of an anti-hero to hero arc. So that's, that's awesome. pretty much, that's pretty much his story kind of in a nutshell. You know, I won't give all the fun details away. I want people to read the comic, but. Oh, know. for sure. Yeah, so. So yeah, I just, you know, I, I basically, like when I was a kid, I loved Iron Man. I loved Batman, you know, it's even, like I said, even though I, I don't really pitch the Spider-Man aspect of it, some of the DNA in the story and like learning something is kind of, you know, part of, I guess, like I said, his arc of what is he gonna, where he starts and where he ends up kind of thing, so. And like I said, I'm, a, I'm also a big Star Trek and Star Wars nerd, so the idea of having a cool spaceship for my heroes just for me as, an, as a fan and as a nerd is just, it's just kind of natural that this, this is what I would wanna create. Like as a fan, this is what I would love to see, so. And, um, and I've spent, you know, like you said, it's been around for a long time, so I've spent a lot of years refining it and, uh, like, and especially because of what I do for a living, like, I've spent a lot of time look, working on these designs, even for the ship. That probably took me a year or two before I finally got it to where I thought it looked cool enough, you know. Wow. And, and I wanted to take the same approach like you do to a movie. You spend months developing the universe, what it looks like. This is the culture, you know, this is what the costumes look like. This mm -hmm. is, and so I put a lot of thought. And I have, I have other ships besides, you know, this is his hero ship. Mm -hmm. um, but the same kind of approach, like, you know, like when you see all the cool ships from Star Wars and Star Trek, that's my goal is like, well, we're going to have more models of the other characters and all that kind of stuff, you know, so. Um, and of course, even with the ship, I, I have fun little like character, like, you know, the one thing I always heard was that besides the Enterprise crew, the Enterprise itself is considered a character in the Star Trek universe, right? Sure. So I've decided that his ship is also kind of the same thing. Like there's a lot of history. It's kind of supposed to be an antique, you know, kind of like the Millennium Falcon, mm -hmm. but it's still one of the fastest ships. And then he'll find out through, like, like since he finds a ship in this suit, the actual former pilot left behind like these like training hologram journals or whatever. So he actually kind of gets to know him. And that's how he becomes a mentor figure. He had never actually met this guy, but then he kind of learns how he's supposed to operate the suit, operate the ship, and then you'll find out like, uh, like the former, like I said, the, the fallen guardsman, mm -hmm. he kept this old ship and he kept this older obsolete suit because he was getting older. He wanted to feel relevance, like I've, you know, and so he kind of uh, symbolically kept both of these. And so, like this ship here, the Aramis 7, and, and uh, that's actually named after one of the Three Musketeers because I always love that story too. And, and there's mm -hmm. even a little bit of a similarity in premise because the idea of a, like a peasant, like D'Artagnan, wanting to join this like mythical guard that serves a king, same sure. kind of a thing. And so I sort of throw in little, DNA references of the Musketeer story too. So that's why the ship's named the Aramis. But um, like it's kind of a 57 Chevy in space. Like, like I said, that's how he treated it. He was always working on it, making sure the engine, you know, modifying right. it. Even though people would be like, why don't you get rid of that piece of junk? It's like 50 years old, you know? And so, and, and there'll be some things in the plot I won't divulge yet, but the fact that it's an older ship, obviously in some ways now works in its favor. Just, okay. just like this suit does basically, so. So yeah, it's really exciting. And when I, when I first got these produced, um, the figurine and uh, the ship were actually modeled by um, I, uh, one of the video game companies that I worked for, uh, Matt Taylor, who now works for Blizzard on World of Warcraft. Uh -huh. He modeled this character. And then two of my friends, Cody Wright and Brett, Brett Nienberg actually modeled the ship and they were on Lego Universe. Um, when, uh, I'm not a modeler myself, so when I would go over there, I would constantly bug them, like I couldn't wait to see these things. And they'd be like, leave us alone, get out of here, you know, let us finish this up. I was always like, you know, a kid on Christmas morning. And so when I actually got these shipped to me, I mean, that was that real surreal, like you see these things that have been living in your head forever mm -hmm. and you physically can hold them in your hand. I mean, I had to sit there for like 10 minutes just to like, wow, this is real. I can't believe this, you know? So 
How cool is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I, in, in, I, to be honest with you, I'll never get over it. You know what I mean? Like, I'll, I'll admit, I sit there and I take the ship and kind of fly it around and pretend like it's landing and stuff. Not kind of. You fly right. it around? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So, yeah. Anyway, but. That's awesome. And you're, uh, you're reaching some pretty big success these days. With a, Can you talk about some of the TV show involvement here? Sure, yeah. This last week I just announced that uh, both the, this figurine and the ship, um, and actually the t-shirts that are also sitting here, uh, were all sent out to the set of the Big Bang Theory last week. And so they're actually uh, a permanent part of um, props and set dressing and wardrobe. And so at some point when you're watching Big Bang Theory, you'll get to see him and you'll get to see these t-shirts here in the comic shop and then the ship also. So that'll be really fun. And you know, that, that'll be another surreal, really cool moment to actually see that, you know, while the characters are running. And like any of us who love any kind of pop culture, geek nerd stuff, I mean, that, that show was pretty much tailor-made for us. Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel like that's the first show that actually you know, speaks my language. So, so for me, it's it's kind of a double thrill to be like, you know, and and now it's become one of the most popular shows. Is, so, yeah. so the the idea of exposure with the amount of the audience, you know, numbers that it carries is going to be pretty significant for me. So I'm going to really try and utilize um, as much as I can, you know, just now that it's actually connected to the show. And actually, when I made the announcement, which I do a lot, I, I kind of promote everything uh, like a grass grassroots way on Facebook. Um, you know, people are already, I got tons of requests for the t-shirts as uh -huh. soon as I announced, you know, so, so now I'm going to have to figure out how to keep up with the demand and, you know, run my store, which uh, it should be up soon on my website, but yeah. So, so. the first time you actually see it on the Big Bang, um, are you going to do the happy dance? Something, yes. <laughs> the happy dance and if I was acrobatic, I'd be doing backflips and, and everything, yeah, so yeah, it'll, it'll definitely be a celebratory moment for me, for sure. That's awesome. So what else are you working on, man? Well, uh, right now, like I said, uh, this year I'm, I'm still developing Black Alpha. We're in the midst of almost finishing up issue one, and I have a, a couple of friends. Uh, a friend of mine, Drew Hunt, who I also worked with at the video game company, he's done some stuff for like Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm. He wrote an amazing script, and once again, it's really cool to find someone who can give a voice to your story. Because, I mean, the way that I think of myself, for lack of a better term, is like, you know, when you grow up admiring a George Lucas or Gene Roddenberry, that's kind of what I'm doing is sort of guiding the vision of all of this. And then when you right. find people that can bring the talent and sort of let get out of the way and let them do their thing, Drew Hunt has been that way. Just has written an amazing script. He just got in with issue two. And so when I read it, I'm almost like an audience member. I get really excited. Like some of the stuff he came up with, with my general like direction, tone and all that, and then he'll add all these really fun details. So he wrote the script and then Christian Colbert, um, he, he's done some pretty cool stuff. He's doing some stuff for, uh, he's done some stuff for Dark Horse comics lately, but um, he, it's almost like if I could find a guy that could be me, like if I had a clone, it was him. I found him. I kind of call him my artistic soulmate. And actually, I told him this. I personally prefer the way he does my characters over the way I do them. Really? Yeah. I, I, if, I could, if I could have him draw the entire thing, because right now we're collaborating. He's doing the line work, and then we're both, you know, and I started, I actually started the first few pages. We're kind of meeting in the middle, so he's doing the color work, and we're kind of merging all that stuff that some people say they can't tell us apart. I can tell us apart, and like I said, I'm more of a fan of his than I am of mine, so. <laughs> but it says a lot. Oh, well, and real quick, too. So the style of it, um, like when people actually read the comic, and, and I'll have announcements down the road, um, which I'll touch upon here in a sec. Um, I picked this animated style partially because, you know, comics are a lot of work. They really are. I mean, and... And especially like, like a lot of people, when you're an independent creator, you tend to have to do this stuff on the side. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a labor of love, it's a passion. Um, and so I figured, well, if I do the animated style, it should go by a little quicker. The other idea is that, you know, as I'm shopping this around, you know, I've talked to a movie producer, uh, you know, I've talked to a couple of people about making a video game, is that I, and also with the 3D stuff, I wanted to see how it would translate across genres. And so once again, I figured if, well, if we're gonna do a cartoon of this and they need proof of concept, they've already mm -hmm. got it right here in the comic. And once again, Kind of the, 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 the hyper-stylized animated style trans, translates well to toy stuff, too. So, um, but anyway, so he, and he does such a good job at that. So that, like, the notion is when people actually see the comic, um, I put a lot of, like, you know, work into the background. So, I mean, Toon Shaded is generally, for people who don't understand, is like, you know, it's usually you got a flat and you do highlights and shadows. Mm -hmm. That's how you see a cartoon. And then, you know, the more in-depth comics, they add a lot more, you know, just detail and the rendering and the shading and stuff. Right. We're, we're kind of viewing it as like meeting in the middle so that the tune shaded style will be like as if it was like a scene out of one, like an animated film. So once mm -hmm. again, specifically, that's kind of the aesthetic uh, behind this and stuff. So, but anyway, yeah, getting back on track, we're, um, we're almost done with issue one. And I've had a lot of people, it's been really fun, like people have responded very well to this on, uh, on Facebook. I've already got tons of like on the Black Alpha Facebook page and they, there's no comic out yet. So, right. so I, I spend a lot of time kind of getting them involved, showing them behind the scenes, you know, any, anything as it progresses I try and share. So, um, so when we get that done 
and, and I'll tie this actually into Denver Comic Con, is that uh, we have a really big announcement that we're going to share at Denver Comic Con. Um, so that's all I can really say about it at the moment, but mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty huge. And I'm really excited to share that. And I actually, I have a really awesome trailer that's going to accompany that. Um, but it, it will be big news, and it's kind of part of the way of the future and stuff. So, so there'll be kind of this interesting combination, like when I announce what I can announce with one format that we're going to kind of get this out there to an audience, I will have a limited print run of also Black Alpha issues one, you know, nice. that I will basically be able to sell once Denver gets here and stuff. And right. so that's the goal. And the idea is I won't have a lot of them because I, I kind of want people to sort of view it in all these different... You know, if you want to get on, you know, any of your portable device and you want to see it on the internet too, you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of want to take both approaches. But the idea is, at least, when people, at, when I talk to people at the Denver Comic Con and then they, they want to take an issue away with them, you know, at least hopefully they'll help spread the word. I guess that's part of the notion behind it too. Like if they enjoy it, they'll tell their friends to go check it out on the website or any right. of those other things. So, but the, the one thing I have learned is that, yeah, when you go to cons, um, you know, because there's kind of been this like weird shift where people are, you know, the whole digital getting out thing, you know, like like Marvel just had that thing where they released, did you hear about it? They released like uh, 700 titles or something like oh, at South yeah. by South and then the server crash for Comixology, you know, yeah. so everyone's still trying to explore like how do we, how do we monetize the digital space, right. you know, so and I'm kind of moving that direction too, but I've, I've learned that people like even myself, you know, people like something they can, they can sit there and pick and hold up and, yep. and um, you know, and so, and by the way, this is an issue one, this is a preview edition. Um, I've actually sold quite a few of these at the cons and stuff, but a lot of times people uh, will come back and they'll read a little bit and they're, they're intrigued, so they come back and ask me questions the next day. But more than anything, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool. Like, I've gotten a great response, and especially from the kids. You know, of course, they see all this stuff. They want to run over. They want to know when they can buy it, you know, and mm -hmm. that's another thing I'm working toward is, you know, is to find basically a licensing deal so that I can mass produce this stuff. Because right now, it's me, like in the, just a small team of people I mentioned that are kind of all collaborating on this project. But, uh, but yeah, I just, the way things are going with this opportunity I'll announce at Denver Comic Con, the stuff with the Big Bang Theory, uh, actually talking to, you know, movie producer, video game stuff, I feel like it will get to that level eventually. Right. And if I have one legacy that I want to leave behind as a fan is that, you know, I, I wanted to basically give an audience my Batman or my Star Wars, that's you awesome. know, so that's kind of my dream. And so I feel like I'm finally living my dream, you know, that all these years so cool. later and stuff like that. So, yeah. That is so cool. So, uh, like, personally, you know, what, you know, what do you geek out on besides what you're working on, and what are you all into? Um, well, art would be probably you know one of the number ones. Uh, I, and, and film, I love movies. Uh, one of my goals, too, when I was a kid, well, I, I joke around that I had like four or five goals uh, when I was a young boy. I wanted to be a starship captain, first of all. Um, eventually, I wanted to write and direct films. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a hairdresser and do hair, and I wanted to do comic books. And so I, I, I joke around and say, which one did I make come true? But I. I've kind of done the rock star thing, you know, I've been in a band and, uh, and then also, like I said, done comics for a while and I feel like in a sort of a way, Black Alpha for me is like a culmination of all those things coming together because I do see it as maybe a potential feature, you know, a film franchise. Sure. And, and so I feel like, yeah, the kid in me, uh, except for the Starship Captain part, I'm still holding out for that one, <laughs> but everything else I feel like is coming together. And so, um, so I'm still a huge fan of films and comics, like everything I've loved as a kid it's it's like it's never diminished, you know. So that's why I think like the age that we live in, where other people are embracing these things. And and I've never been one of those like you know how like people be into indie bands, mm -hmm. that indie band blows up and then they're like oh I don't like him anymore because everyone else. I, I'm just like you know the more the merrier because it's like you know people are discovering any of us who've appreciated these things for years. They're like oh that is cool and I'm like that's what I've been trying to tell everyone. Welcome aboard kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my attitude about it. So. But I would have to say, uh, you know, anything that I do, if I enjoy anything out of life, it still has to always do with comics, movies, uh, toys, you know, and right. that's pretty much what and rocks my world. I mean, like I said, in a TV show like The Big Bang Theory, um, actually, I made a joke on Facebook recently because Sheldon was saying something to, to Leonard about, you know, he was going to relieve him of command because Starfleet Order 104 section, he, he actually incorrectly said it, Section A said he would, you know, he was compromised, he would have to relieve him. And I knew that reference, and I got so excited I had to talk about it on Facebook. So that's where I'm like, once again, this show is made for me and other people. They they get it all right, all you know, all the Starfleet uh, regulations and all that stuff. So I just feel like, yeah, we live we live in such an amazing age that you can go see the Avengers, you know, mm -hmm. co uh, comic book movies made into film, like all these things that you, as a young child, when the technology wasn't there, you're able to go, what would an Iron Man movie be like, or you know, right. these things. And now now we can see those things. And they're finally doing them right too. Exactly. I mean, you know, Avengers was. Freaking amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were so many times, like, like there were, you know, I mean, I, I literally got chills. It was like when you would see certain parts of the movie with Thor and the Hulk. I mean, that's things you're like, what would that be like, you know, when you're yeah. like, you know, 10, 10, 11 years old. And 
so that's been really exciting too and, and I guess that's why like you know when I know there's some fans out there that kind of grumble about the quality of things or they get overly caught up in the technicality my thing is like sure you want to you know you want to maintain quality but I'm still just celebrating like we have such an amazing like age that you you can actually see all these movies and, and I I think that's why comic book films are so popular because it's like you know the technology of Hollywood is like we need things I think that's why even Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter all that stuff became so popular and prevalent because it's like you know like Hollywood needs big ideas to support this big technology now right. which is which is also very exciting and stuff so but uh, yeah and, and I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about the Star Trek movie coming up this summer everything else that's going with it you know and, and the funny thing is you know I didn't think about this but uh, I watched uh, one of the old Spider-Man cartoons when I was a kid and I never occurred to I would sit there and I'd go why is he only fighting a guy with nunchucks I, I don't understand that you know what I mean uh -huh. and then even then they'd show him struggling against this regular dude and, and I'm just like that's not Spider-Man but it you know obviously later on I'm like well because they didn't have the technology to do any of the super villains you know basically so so yeah I guess like I said there's never been a better time to be a super nerd and so I guess you know <laughs> I, I carry that proud or I, I carry that flag proudly I guess <laughs> what I'm trying to say so well, congratulations on the super nerdness <laughs> So what do you got? Uh, what do you got planned for Denver Comic Con? What kind of booth you got? Um, well, basically, uh, well, once again, with the announcement I'm going to make, I have a team that's coming out, and they're going to, we're going to, like I said, we're going to do this big panel, and we're going to talk about the announcement that has to do with Black Alpha, mm -hmm. and we're just going to kind of talk about the industry, and, and once again, sort of touch upon what I've tried to do, which is to launch your own franchise, like kind of in the, in the sort of a garage band sense, mm -hmm. uh, and then basically, I'm just going to be there uh, selling issue, you know, the limited editions of issue one, and, and of course, I love nerding out, you know, people come up to me, and and ask all these questions and uh, some of my friends have even teased me about I've already got my own small group of Trekkies growing where they, they come they're, they're into it they want to ask all these questions and it's yeah. so much fun to kind of nerd out with them because like because oh, yeah. like I tell people you know I, I was that kid that could tell you you know the Enterprise crew was 430 you know the Enterprise had 22 decks I, I knew all of that stuff and so as a creator now as an adult creator that all came in handy because I'm like sure. I had to sit there and make sure that all the rules of this universe make sense from a cultural level you know, because if you want the audience to be invested in your universe and believe in it, you got to make sure all those corners are covered, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm like, you know, I can tell you this ship here has two decks. It's roughly about 150 feet in length. And, you know, and so people want to, or how do the cell suits work, the, the power suits that these guardsmen use? And I've got already all that notes figured out. And so when they come and ask me questions, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do it. And I totally nerd out with them. But probably one of the biggest, the biggest things that I've had is the, uh, there's been a couple of really cool instances where, uh, a young a young kid will walk up to me and he'll ask questions and um, this actually happened last year at the Denver Comic Fest and then eventually Denver Comic Con. He was intrigued. He's like, well, what is this? So I talked to him and he was very interested. And so after five or ten minutes, I'm like, here you go, buddy. I gave him a poster and I'm like, I, I, I just want to say thanks for being interested. And, in, you know, you've never heard of this guy and you're taking yeah. interest. So he came back about five minutes later and brought his dad. And he's like, yeah, he, he wanted me to come over here and meet you and stuff. And uh, so he, he goes, he said, I appreciate you taking the time for my son. And so, you know, I sat there and I looked at him and I said, how old is he? And he goes, he's 11. And so the, the boy's name was uh, uh, Ian. And I said, I was your age, actually, when I came up with this character. So I said, for me, I said, it really touches my heart that you're interested in something that I've created. Yeah. Just like I was interested in Star Wars and Star Trek, all that as a young kid. So, so anyway, they'll actually come and follow me at cons. And so he actually, he got a yellow t-shirt for me and I signed it, he wanted me to autograph it, and he did his little happy dance as he ran away. So I think, I think for me, you know, when you think about trying to, like, what you have for your goals in your life or whatever legacy that you want to leave behind, this is mine. And so I, I'm very much moved by, especially kids, responding. Because that's, oh, that's another question, too. Some people have asked, like, the audience range of this, because I've talked to a few families, and uh, it's an all audiences title. Um, doesn't mean it's just kitty fair. I mean, it's not Power Rangers, you know. Right. But it's, once again, it's like, like uh, I want to sort of show I love the fact that I could watch Star Trek and Star Wars and not be embarrassed that there was inappropriate stuff. I could share that with my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And and you know, like when you talk about even like uh, with the what is it the comic the comic classroom where they're trying to you know focus on yeah. yeah for the kids you know like that's one of the struggles that's been going on in the industry for well almost 20 years now is like you know the the industry the the readership has dwindled and so the you know the the comic book industry in general is always trying to figure out ways how do we get kids into it? And so there's sort of been this stigma like, oh, if it's an all ages title, it's too kiddy, and you know, people want to shy away from it. Well, I'm trying to sort of bring that back. Like, like I could go pick up a comic book, my mom or dad could open it, and they would be fine with the most of the material that was in there. Right. I'm sort of trying to take the same approach where I'm like, you know, I want to create like people, you know, my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, but also bring the kids back in. And, and once again, give, you know, give them a new kind of hero that hopefully they'll relate to and, you know, I guess look up to basically at some point, so. Right on. That's badass, man. 
Well, I appreciate your time today, dude. Thank you so much. I almost, said, I almost said the other name again, but I'm going to say thanks, Groovy. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. You can call me whatever you want. We'll do happy dances. Cool. <laughs> this is Groovy Ware, Breckenridge Brewery. This is Tom Rash, Black Alpha, a whole bunch of other cool stuff going on. And his big announcement is huge. And I'm just going to make him sweat a little bit that I'll say it on camera, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> right on!